you are being conformed into the image of a son. And a son prays and says, I know my purpose. It's being worked out with my father. Father, glorify your name. Not my name, not my soul. Don't do it my way, Lord. We're in this together. You just, which way are we going? Many times, there's a war being waged in our souls. And I don't know if, it, I don't want to, I just want to close this down and move to the next one, but um, we have to understand that the nature of being a spirit-filled believer it's exactly that, a spirit filled. Exactly that, spirit filled, which means body, soul, spirit. Somebody was talking earlier about that. We were talking. Somebody was in one of one of my conversations here tonight. Body, soul, spirit, and the soul, which is very used to being me. When the veil is cut between the soul and the spirit, and the spirit starts flooding into the soul, it says, "Wait." Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not sure I like this. I was going to do an illustration tonight and take a, a glass of water and just put drops of food coloring in that changes the color of the water. It's a bit like that. I don't know how the water feels about the food color invading it. But when we say, I want to be a spirit filled believer, then you're going to have the spirit invading your soul. Because that's what you asked him to do. And as he does, and as he comes in, there's going to be some troubles in there. Because the what we want, and the way we want it, and the way we think it should be, and the whole thing, it doesn't sometimes turn that way. So we reach for the Spirit and say, Father, glorify your name. Anyway, um, another, another short passage in John. John 17, the first four verses. Okay, Aaron. John 17, this is often called the high priest prayer. It's Jesus' prayer in the garden before he gets arrested. John 17, the first four verses. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. John doesn't record the struggle. Father, if you got a plan B, I'll take it. You know, if there's another cup I could drink, I'm more than willing. But nevertheless, not my will die. The battle. John doesn't record that. He goes to this part of the prayer, which I'm glad he did. But I don't know. In John 12, we read, he prays to the Father. He involves the Father. His Father's always involved, but he involves him at this point when his, when his soul is troubled, working his purpose out. In John 17... I want to see if you guys catch something. I want you to listen really carefully this time. And I'm just wondering if anybody prays the way this prayer reads. One more time, would you read those first four verses? Okay. <clears throat> After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. He looked towards heaven and prayed. Go ahead. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he may have, that, uh, all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given him. That's, you can, that's far enough. Does anything strike you weird about this prayer? I mean, do you guys pray like that? Do you get up in the morning and say, Father, glorify your Son? I mean, it might say glorify me, Help me out here. I might use the I and me pronouns. There's no I and me pronouns in there. His identity is not himself, the soul, but it is being the son of God. Okay. That's what I got. 
I mean, who's praying? Good question. Well, <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? Because yeah. no, read a little further. Now, keep, now read a little further. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work Who you did? gave me to do. What did he say? I have. I have. Now all of a sudden it's I have. And he moves into the first person. It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, Unless we act... Talk talking in the third person in the first... No doubt about it. And you can find any translation you want. It's always going to read the same. Wonder why? Because it's the Spirit. Oh, okay. The Spirit is praying for the Son. Mm. Wow. Wow, that's yeah. interesting, yes. Yes, somebody did tell me not long ago it that... It is wonderful, isn't it? The Holy wow. Spirit continues to pray for us even when we're sleeping, when we can't consciously pray for ourselves. Here we've got Jesus, mm. and the Spirit says... You guys been doing, you know, Father and the Son, you are one, the whole thing. And the Spirit intercedes for Jesus. Just like Paul says, you remember in Romans 8, right before Paul, says that wonderful thing in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. The two verses before that, in Romans 8, 26 and 27, he says, well, the thing is, you guys, sometimes you don't know how to pray. You don't know what to pray for. But the Spirit intercedes for you. Amen. Mm. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to tie these things together and be clever. I'm just saying, the passage reads the way it reads. It starts off in a very strange way. Jesus himself referring to Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden he kicks into, I've finished the work that you've given me to do. And there's no doubt anymore in the prayer. There's no, no doubt anymore because it reads like a normal prayer after that. What I'm saying is this. We're talking about purpose. Both of these passages, 12 and 17, they both center around prayer. In 12, it's very clear. Jesus is praying to his Father. Father, glorify your name. And it's a great passage. We, didn't, we just tapped it. In John 17, again, he's praying to the Father. But he's not praying in the first person. In fact, it's the Spirit who's praying on his behalf that's interceding for him. Now, we didn't read the whole prayer, but we read enough to see that he says, I finished the work, referring to everything he did as the work. He hasn't been to the cross yet. He's finished all the work, so to speak. But again, he states the purpose, that they may know that you are the one true God. The same thing Elijah says, the same thing David says. It's from cover to cover. Mm -hmm. The purpose is clear, that our Father would be made known. Works always work, so to speak, to um, reveal purpose. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Doing the good works is understood. Let your light so shine on them. The light referring to your life. May your life reveal a life of good works. That's more goal-oriented. But why? What's the second half of the verse? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, there's a purpose to it. We're not just doing good works, you know, to chalk them up on a chalkboard. But they may see the good works, and that's the purpose, that they may glorify your Father. It's very similar. See, our purpose, God's purpose, is a spiritual one, for sure. It's a work of the Spirit of grace and truth that came through Jesus Christ. Spiritual work. That's manifest in the natural. Our last passage is in the next chapter, John 18. Um, verse 11, we'll just start with verse 11. Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put the sword into the sheath. The cup which the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Peter's ready to wage war in the garden. 
and Jesus tells him to put it away, put away his, his sword, the way you do things, your way of thinking. Put it away. Get rid of it. And you hear what I said in John 12 about loving your own life, loving your own soul, getting caught up in that whole thing? Put it away. And then he makes the statement, shall I not drink the cup the Father's given me? We could spend an entire evening on the cup. We're not going to. But he's basically saying, the Father has given me this cup to drink. Are you suggesting that I don't drink the cup the Father has given me? Now, you can't say exactly what he's referring to. In Psalm 16, 5, in fact, let's read it. Somebody have, it's a beautiful verse. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. Now, Psalm 16 is the psalm that's about the cross, about him going to hell and everything. As you work your way through the psalm. There's more psalms like that too, but this in Psalm 16. I can't help but think that there's a reference when he says to Peter, he's basically saying, God's given me this cup, but I have confidence that he's not going to let my soul stay in Sheol, that he's going to raise me, and I shall sit at the right hand of the Father. So I'm doing the cup, because we've been in this thing together. That's where we're going. Um, the cup could be seen like, you know, playing the hand you're dealt. We use that as kind of an expression. I know way too many people, and it's just not being critical, it's just I do. You know, things happen, I ain't having that. I'm not having that. We've got this charismatic theology that's a killer. We're not halfway where we should be because we've gotten caught up, and I'm not having that. Oh, so basically you're not going to drink the cup then. That's basically what we're saying. No, I'm not drinking that cup. Okay. But it is the Lord's portion. It's what he's given you. We end up waging war in the garden. There's a dimension of our lives as sons that involves pain and suffering. And when the cup comes, no, nobody likes to drink the cup. But that's not, the, that's not the, the question. Do I want to and like to drink it? Jesus is basically saying, are we going to drink the cup that the Father gives us? He's already made up his mind. It was interesting, I was doing, I was thinking about this with the, and I started looking, I was trying to figure out, you know, because you know like with, with sporting events, at the end of a sporting event they give them a cup. And I, you know, like uh, the Stanley Cup or something we just had a couple weeks ago. And cups, these cups and um, trophies. I was just trying to sort it out and get the history of it. Who did it? Who's the first one to use a cup? Because it's kind of an interesting. And as I was sifting through it, nobody's quite sure, quite frankly. They don't know. Trophies have been going on since people for thousands of years, back to wars when they brought different forms of disgusting trophies back. But somewhere is around a thousand years ago, nobody knows where, somebody came up with the idea to give the winner of a competition a cup. And the guys, the article I was reading, he said, and it wasn't a Christian article, it was a historical article, he was just saying that, you know, to win any event, we've heard the expression, you've got to pay the price, no pain, no gain. And these guys who work for these cups and these athletic competitions and stuff, they work really hard. They don't say, no, I'm not drinking the cup. Because they know in order to get the cup, they better drink the cup. If they want the cup at the end, they've got to work hard. It involves a lot of hard work, a lot of pain and suffering. Most of the people say, I ain't doing that. Well, great, then you ain't going to get a cup. I mean, that's okay. It's your call. But the ones who are willing to go through it are the ones who get the cup. And it's a, it signifies that. They were willing to do whatever was necessary to get this cup. They worked really hard. And uh, it got me thinking, you guys remember that song by America in the early 70s? 
uh, the Lonely People song. Yeah. This is for all the lonely people. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's a you do from the silver cup. Yeah. Very mystical kind of line. Say that again, Russ. Don't give up till you drink from the silver cup. And I was thinking about that when I was just, you know, thinking about this part of the, the uh, thing about the cup. You know, what did he mean by that? Well, you know, what is that? What does that mean? And so I, I went and I read what it meant, according to him. And basically, the guy who wrote the song from the group America was disturbed because of Eleanor Rigby. Great song, but a song of hopelessness. It leaves you with a sense of hopelessness. You know, where do these people come from? Where do they all belong, you know? And so he wanted to write a song for all the lonely people that would uh, be an encouragement, don't give up. Don't give up until you drink from the silver cup, which was kind of interesting. And he said this, the guy who wrote the song, uh, Dan Peake, I think is his name, something like that. Anyway, the guy that wrote the song, for him, what he was trying to encourage single and lonely people to do mm. is don't give up. Eleanor, Eleanor Rigby almost throws you in a pot of despair. He says, don't give up until you drink from the silver cup. Did he tell what he thought the silver, what that meant yeah, to him? Yeah, to him, what that meant was that when you meet that person, you've got your silver cup. You meet like your husband or your wife, mm -hmm. you meet that person. And this was the line that really got me. He said, it's possible to drink from another person's well of experience and be refreshed. I love that line. It's possible to drink from someone else's well of experience and be refreshed. That's a line in the song? No, that's just a line that he said oh, when they were talking amazing. to him about the silver cup. Wow. Now, he became a Christian, by the way. He changed the words to the song. Because in the original song, it said, don't give up until you drink from the silver cup. And there was another line after it. And, and ride, ride the, the highway in the sky. And ride the highway in the sky. Don't give up until you drink from the silver cup and give your life to Jesus Christ. Oh, Those yeah. are the new words. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because as far as he's concerned, and this is the way he sings it when he performs it now. Wow. He changed the lyrics to reflect his silver cup not just in his wife, oh. that when he met his wife as a lonely person yes. meeting his wife and she was his silver cup. Hallelujah. And so he's, he has drunk from her life. But he now, after becoming a Christian, is saying to everybody in all the concerts that he sings, you know, don't give up until you drink from the silver cup. And you can do that if you give your life to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You got the cup. Mm -hmm. And it's the cup of blessing, like Paul talks about. It's a cup of blessing. It's not a cup of pain and suffering. Anyway, um, wanted to continue through John 18, but it's, it's almost, it, well, it is, it's, it's 10 now, and I could see that people are kind of tired. So what I think I'll do is hold on to the rest of John 18 uh, for next week. I think that, that speaks wisdom. And tonight we'll just leave ourselves with John 12. He involves the Father. John 17, Holy Spirit gets involved. And we got as far as the cup kind of thing. Okay. Um, we will be, we'll stay in John 18 next week. Basically the verses when uh, Jesus is having his exchange with Pilate. And he, and he says to Pilate as, the, as it unfolds, you know, it's for this reason, for this purpose that I was sent, that I came to bear witness of the truth. Mm -hmm.